thank you, Renee, and thank you all so much for being here. This is so exciting. I think it's um, just thrilling and exciting that we have a Lit Fest in the town of Exeter. Um, and I heard that today was wonderful events around town and also last night. Um, so welcome, I'm Sarah Anderson. This is The Word Barn, if you haven't been here. Um, and I have a, a reading series, the Silo series, and I was um, excited when we said we could coordinate and work together. Um, so this evening we'll be hearing from um, eight readers. Thank you, readers, for being here. Um, before we start, I would like to say a few quick thank yous. Um, first to my husband, Ben Anderson, behind the bar. And, my son Angus, who's already gone in the house, but to my neighbor kids across the street in Milford Parking. Um, also to my friend Jen Evans, who's not here right now, but she made the cookies. Oh, and I would love for you to help yourself. Um, help yourself to those cookies and coffee as well. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about what happens here, the best way to do that is to look at our website, thewordbarn.com, um, and you can also join our mailing list. Okay, so I'd like to get started introducing um, the format actually this evening will be I will introduce um, the first reader and then from there the, the writers, the readers will introduce each other. Um, we'll hear from four people and then we'll have a 15 minute break and then hear from the last four. So our first reader, um, Ralph Sneedon's poems and essays have appeared in Agni, the American Poetry Review, the Common, Ecotone, Harvard Review, the Kenyon Review, the New Republic, Plowshares, Slate, Southwest Review, The Surfer's Journal, and many other magazines. He has been awarded fellowships at the McDowell Colony, the American School in London, and Columbia University. The title of his book, Evidence of the Journey, received the Friends of Literature Prize from po Poetry Magazine, and he's been teaching at Phillips Exeter Academy since 1995. Um, I also forgot to mention that there are some books out on the table, so feel free to check those out and to go right up to the writer if you're interested. Welcome, Ralph. Well, thanks for coming out, and thanks to the committee and to Sarah for um, putting this together. And some other recent, sort of recent poems. Um, uh, and I've been writing a lot about music lately, uh, especially in my in my poems. I have been writing a lot of poems. I've been doing mostly uh, nonfiction, um, but uh, my poetry keeps gravitating towards music and musicians and composers. Um, and I. I, I wrote this poem this week after a flurry a couple of weeks ago in a family text loop uh, that, that, that went crazy. <laughs> and uh, it was about my, my, my mother, who uh, was still around, uh, and she was a dancer. Uh, yeah, let me qualify that. Uh, it'll get profane, but it, it's not that. Um, um, anyway, uh, so she started a dancing school. She wanted to make it in New York, so she went to New York after she graduated from high school after the war. And, um, and then she ended up starting a dancing school. And uh, she, there, there have always been pictures of her dancing in all the houses that I grew up in, and even now. And um, do, you, do, you, do you know the, the song, Me and My Shadow? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Then you don't need anything else for this poem. Um, Anything else I need to explain? No, I don't think so. Uh, me and my shadow. That photo of my mom tapping in blackface hangs in every house she's lived. Somehow, after my father dies, amateur carpenter, dutiful engineer, she always persuades someone else, not me, to mount it. I've tried to call her gently out 
as you would a proud and decent woman in her 90s, balked at throwing it out without her knowing. <laughs> Broke out the next day, she says, describing the shoe polish on her forehead, cheeks. <laughs> Couldn't get it off. While politicians weasel off the hook, she whitewashes her own imitation as an imitation of the shadow itself, all alone and feeling blue, which ignores the hour, the me, i.e., not a soul to tell our troubles to. An antecedent demands a body, a denial of light, <coughs> that lends a patch, a patch of darkness its depth, definition. Shadows depend on obstruction, the dancer as both a dam and a reference. Like the teleology of a cover tune, alleged tribute, even though we're struck sometimes by the shadow striking back, supplanting the original, becoming a better song. It Don't Come Easy by Betty Levette does justice to paying dues. Her smoldering minor blues married to the lyric, unlike Ringo's funkless march. Or take Sharon Jones, This Land is Your Land. How eerie, true. Soulful protest? I made her take it down. <laughs> it's kind of like, talk about weaseling, you know, I'm writing that poem, and I, after a while, I said, why am I intellectualizing all of this, you know? Some sort of self-argument, and finally, it's just like, just say it. You told her to take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andrea Cohen read it Exeter yesterday, and she had a great poem that I I wanted to steal it for an epigraph. You know, uh, the shadow boxer's complaint: shadows don't fight fair. <coughs> poem. And I was, uh, but it, it would be terrible to, to use a poem as an epigraph when that epigraph is better than the poem. <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, this uh, next poem is my, uh, I, I guess it's my argument against uh, organized sports and certain religious institutions. <laughs> it's called Meditation. I spent too much time in Catholic churches and hockey rinks, and I can't nail why the two conspire so in memory, only that each evokes a dread I used to think was awareness of time being wasted, time not spent outdoors, but inside, embalmed with boredom and incense, or anxiety in that meat locker mist through which I skated, chasing down a puck behind the net. Yes, in those wars, Something subtly exhilarating abided the benches. Helmeted among the steaming shoulders, I counted the Zamboni's final laps. New surface they promised, not unlike the masses hoped for end. The day beyond its babbling space, its gestures, smoke, bells and whistles, familiar rituals of boys damaging boys, men damaging boys and men, men in uniforms or robes protecting men. <clears throat> and I'll do one more. Um, yeah, little rock and roll poem. Uh, Jimi Hendrix poem. Contrapunctus number two. I thank the God of overheated amplifiers and strings bent to breaking for Hendrix breaking his ankle, jumping out of planes, briefly Army Airborne, only to drift to the Brits, who were more at ease with his particular species of blues. He'd returned to America, you can't write this, to negotiate the insults of commerce over genius. Jacksonville, July 67, the great guitarist warming up for the Monkees, a made-for-TV band. I love the contrived affront that he was dumped from the tour because the Daughters of the American Revolution opposed the erotic theatrics of his shows. Sad cliché I almost wish were true for entertainment's sake. 
but a blessing to have avoided what a noted Catalan violist said about the fate of Charles VII. Just the music of his enemies survived. Luckily, our hero had his experience, his band of gypsies, and might have hit the road with the DAR to crown the soundtrack he'd begun and bewitch those witches by burying them with feedback, <laughs> rendering nickel-wound voltage with the enamel of his teeth into marches we could follow, lost in his insurrection of pull-off and hammer-on, how his tremolo might blend and surrender such roaring chords, their capacity to soften the fucking racket of those tired fifes and drums. <laughs> Next reader is Chelsea Woodard. She's the author of the collections Vellum, Able Muse Press, 2014, and Solitary B, Measure Press, 2016. Her poems have appeared in the Three Penny Review, Southwest Review, Blackbird, Asheville Poetry Review, and elsewhere. She has received fellowships from the Sewanee Writers Conference and Summer Literary Seminars and teaches at Phillips Exeter Academy. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much, Ralph, and thank you to Sarah and Ben for having us. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's so nice to be with my new colleagues who are so wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm new to Phillips Exeter, so. Um, I thought I would read a couple of poems um, from a new manuscript, um, and three of these poems are animal poems. I've been really interested in, always sort of in the animal world, but lately about how the animal world sort of intersects <laughs> with our world, our world, which is their world, really, but <laughs> this is about one of those intersections. Um, it's called Coyote. Slinking through the brush in the dip between two pastures. She pauses to stare where we walk past the lowered heads of Holstein's grazing, then turns to the north. I've never seen one before. Her fur reddish in twilight, the same warm tones as the grass. Her body is slight, her ears pricked like the pet that sleeps next to us, tail tucked, gaze gold flecked, feral pointing where her quick movements will follow. Trotting slowly uphill, crossing the road where hay bales thin in the soft clanking of cowbells, she dissolves from our view. I heard coyotes howling in packs as a child, my cheek pressed to the bedroom window. Bodiless, roaming night forests like ghosts, their emptiness seemed like a hole in the dark, sharp in the cold cast of the moon. But here, the sun cuts yellow edges on the tufts of field, turned up by hooves, and the wild dog reappears where pine branches and bog come together. Closer to shadows now, she is as real as the stranger you know as your own, wary and eager, a thief in your home. I wrote this poem for um, a friend who had pretty bad postpartum depression. Um, and she told me afterwards, when she was better, it was like a year or two afterwards, that during this really hard time, she was having a battle with this bird <laughs> that was nesting in her hanging plants on her porch. Um, and so this is for her. <laughs> and it's called Wren's Nest. The window of my sadness opened to a bird, boisterous and chirping from the back porch lattice, piling her cradle of twigs beneath the spread of new leaves. It was spring, and the worst part supposedly passed, but the sunlight was scoring through spotless glass, and there was no hanging roost where I could hide under the shade of a roof behind a screen of geraniums. 
the flowers would slowly die. Inside, I heard the hollow of my baby's cry slice through the rooms. Sometimes, I wanted to kill the bird, uproot her brood that brought mildew and drought to my plants, that daily squirming and pink filled my eyes with new blindness. Nature bred pain. But then I saw, amid thin straw and birch down, snippets of thread, where she had sewn the cotton sacks of spiders' eggs into the sticks. As if, by instinct, she had known the unseen threat of mites, perils that lurked within her chick's own feathers. And so she wove the greater danger underneath the fibers of her home, holding that darkness close, keeping her worry sharp against the things she loved. <laughs> This poem I wrote um, about a family friend who um, has a lot of areas of expertise, but um, one in particular is he is an open water swimmer. Um, and not only does he do that, he lives near the Kennebec River in Maine, and he'll swim from, from like May through October in crazy cold water. <laughs> but he's also served as a coach um, to other swimmers, like U.S. swim team people, and has trained them to cross the English Channel. Um, and I love hearing him talk about that process. Um, so this is for him, and it's called Open Water Swimmer. <coughs> At first, your ankles tell you to get out, he says. And on the dock, I understand at once the natural tendency to flee what is too raw, too deep. I dip my hand into the lake, clear, cold as the sea. Primitive, conserving, the body carries doubt under its surface, in the nerves whose waves roar in my fingers each time they thaw, revived from freezing. Tireless, for weeks he swims in salty coves, northernmost ponds, rivers swollen in late spring, until the fat moves just beneath the surface of his skin. Shivers prickle my limbs that are still dry, still learning how to love their reflex shudder when the distance brims. And then this is the last one. Um, it's from um, my last book, which was really like the first book they got published out of order. But, um, uh, and it's another animal poem. I had a desk in that we didn't have room for where we were living before, and so I had to put it in the basement which wasn't a great writing space, but <laughs> um, it was a finished basement. But every now and then I'd be like, I'm going to go right at my desk. And um, I had an encounter, an animal encounter, <laughs> inside while I was doing this. Um, this is called The Bat. <laughs> Downstairs, above my writing desk, her body flitted overhead without my knowing. Something moth-like, a momentary shadow on the ceiling light a breath. It took six passes for her presence to take shape, for me to look from where I bent to see the furry underside, her brown wings beating silent in this strange, narrow enclosure, brushing neither the window nor the wall, calm almost, as if she trusted something in kind in here would free her, heard long before I opened it the sudden door leading her back into the dark. I'm going to, it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly M. Flint. Um, she has been featured uh, in Poetry Showcase, an anthology of New Hampshire poets, and has published work in Spectacular Magazine and the Graham House Review. A graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, she has read her work at the Blacksmith House in Harvard Square and at Phillips Exeter Academy, where she teaches English. A devoted organist, quilter, and flower gardener, Kelly has also been known to go on dog safari around the neighborhood with her trusty sidekick, a chocolate lab named Pete, who lounges under her writing desk as the genius loci when she works. 
Although she grew up on a farm in Missouri, she is a fool for swanky, dressy affairs and asks to be invited to any you might know about. <laughs> And when she had a dog who was whelping in the summer, it would get, they would get quite hot. Eventually, my, my father built them an air conditioned dog palace. But <laughs> before that time, they would dig underneath our blackberry bushes because the shade was so dense and just lie there and look up at the skies like, you know, St. Sebastian full of arrows. So, this is a poem about that. And we would feel terrible. <laughs> Blackberry dog near Welping. The dog speaks. <coughs> if blackberries are ghost green on a black sky at noon, why don't that sharpness let the rain out? Nobody lives in sharper houses than the blackberries. A dog could be cool then. If the dog could just take off the hot jacket. If the nipples wouldn't strain like snaps that don't line up. If the puppies didn't have to brew. When the blackberries crawl into their purple hats, puppies slide blind down blood, and the sky blows blue. You won't be wearing such a guilty human head then, in the sun where your dog shines. <laughs> we had, our neighbors had basset hounds. They had two basset hounds named Steve and Brenda. It was <laughs> 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 the 70s, so they could give it the 70s name. And Steve, the basset hound, would come over and try to get it on with the, the Labrador ladies. And you, if you know the heights of dogs, you can imagine poor Steve. <laughs> this is a poem about, I grew up near Hannibal, Missouri, which is where Mark Twain is from. And when I was growing up, everything was named after. So we had the Mark Twain Plaza, Mark Twain Bar and Grill, Mark Twain Mall, Mark Twain Highway, Mark Twain Park. Uh, and we had a place we called the Mark Twain Drink and Drown because it was a like bar on the edge of the lake. I, I, I can't remember what the name all was. People called it the Drink and Drown. Um, but whenever I taught Mark Twain, and, and so I thought he was just our local dude. I didn't realize he was nationally famous. <laughs> nationally famous, right? Apparently, he is the most popular um, foreign writer in Russia, which is interesting. So, I mean, I, you know, I thought he was just our local dude. Anyway, he, in the beginning of Huckleberry Finn, he has a little bit about the dialects of the area, and he talks about the Pike County dialect, which is what I grew up with, and I've, I've tried really hard to get rid of it. <laughs> um, but this is a memory of reading that book and teaching it and having that come into my voice again, sort of to my horror, because, you know, people have a lot of, there's a stigma attached to having any kind of southern accent, you think. This is called, This is the Mississippi River. Dear my 11th grade English class, we'll be reading Huckleberry Finn straight through. I'll try on for you sometime. What's that? It's amazing. It's a beagle. I'm a witch. <laughs> Dear my 11th grade English class, we'll be reading Huckleberry Finn straight through. I'll try on for you sometime Huck's dialect from Pike County I was born next to. Suddenly, my grandpa, one cup, one spoon. Yellow wheat rounding a red barn. Blue sky and eyes and blue lips holding like a candy stick a whistled tune. Old granulated bathtub, brown shoes shifting, and gums anciently starred with teeth and promises of God damn, the sweat of him wafting and lifting and the skinny loneliness that won't fat up. 
a hickory stick nudging cows as they hugely rock and he talks to them in that language you can see in your flat paged book. Come close to the glass case. This is the Mississippi River diorama, the figure on the water hug Finn, on the river bank my grandpa, and the life-size realistic flames leaping orange inside our classroom as we throw ourselves across the books and diorama men, the trash fire of a wrong, discarded grammar. Sincerely yours and so long. <laughs> I think about that a lot because I, you know, we teach so-called standard English, and I, I, maybe somebody can tell me after the reading, I'm, I'm trying to remember who came up with this idea that the difference between a language and a dialect is who owns the army. <laughs> right? It's the language of power. That is the right one. I'll just read two more. I'll uh, read, yeah, I'll read two more. Um, This one is called Lust Was Keeping Me Up All Night. <laughs> <laughs> Electrical storms jumped on the sun, and the second hand on my watch hiccuped on its track backwards. The great rocks were sentient, completely and all at once suffering the breeze with their new tender skins. The lamps in houses flickered and mewed, Deep under the mountains, the earth broke in a fault line and tried to hold itself together, but it bled. That's what it was. That's what it was, that sudden violent love that kept me up all night while vodka spun my dials, while vodka spun my dials. Someone fired off a gun in the valley, even though it was three in the morning. The dog jumped up from his place under my desk and stared at the door, growling. No matter how, may, how I may cajole him, he will not go back to sleep. I think that's it. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, <laughs> these are kind of older poems. I've been working on some new poems that I forgot that those at home. So fortunately, I have other things with me. Um, this is going to Ralph's point, point of worrying about an epigraph being better than the poem. This poem has an epigraph from the Bible, and the, the poem is called Theology. So I'll start with the epigraph and go into the poem. Theology. Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. But have you ever actually seen a bird when it wasn't at the office? In the Little League field on Chestnut Street, two crows work the outfield all morning. Even a hawk riding the thermals high above our elm tree is punched in at the beauty factory, constantly correcting her course with minutest attention to quality control. Well, whoever said God provides for all creatures may be bent that the animals know God gives them work to do, and they show us to love our work and show us to be beautiful at it and play it as it lays. Thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing Todd Heron. Todd Heron is the author of two collections of poems, Strange Land and No Other Gods. A third collection, Prose in Eden, is forthcoming next spring. His poems, essays, and plays have appeared in Agni, The Common, Kenyon Review, Plowshares, Poetry, Southern Review, and Slate. He is the recipient of a Penn New England Discovery Award, the Friends of Literature Prize from Poetry Magazine and the Poetry Foundation, the Rooney Prize in Poetry from Arts and Letters, and the Campbell Corner Poetry Prize at Sarah Lawrence College. He served as the Dartmouth Poet in Residence at the Frost Place in Franconia, New Hampshire, and was a Joby Paisano Fellow at the University of Texas in Austin. He teaches at Phillips Exeter Academy. Please welcome Todd Harry. Thanks, everybody. 
I'm so happy to be here with my colleagues and Sarah and Ben. Thank you so much for opening up your home to us, the Word Barn, and thank you for providing a cultural home in this town for for music and for and for poetry. We would we would be poorer without you and, and the Word Barn, but it gives to us. So, um, and I'm so happy and, and pleased and privileged to be reading with my colleagues tonight. And since I got to the word barn and have been looking at the crowd, and I've been toying and retoying with my selections. <laughs> Seeing that the audience includes my boss, <laughs> my doctor, and my mother in law. <laughs> the coolest lectern in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with a, a brand new poem. Um, one that came to me last Sunday morning. Uh, it's, it's a small poem and it's written, sorry, my glasses. It's on a subject I know nothing about. It's called sobriety. <laughs> Those Sunday mornings. <laughs> I'm reminded of Chris Christopherson's song, Sunday morning. <laughs> Sobriety. <laughs> Those Sunday mornings you'd adjust yourself to just yourself. A bone white apparition of two ghost pit bulls lapping you awake. The sunlight like a lover saying, stay. Nothing hanging over. The sway and shake of light through a linden on the laden shelves. Not yet the growing growling of an engine. The tumbler holding nothing but the day. I'll read a couple of poems from my first book, Strange Land, and a couple from Lord of Gods, and then we will dispense a break. <laughs> I want to read this and dedicate it to my good friend Ralph Sneedon. Um, this poem has a phrase in it that he hollers at me occasionally when he passes by the car and I'm walking the dog around the town. He goes down the window and yells at me. I'll just let you see if you can guess what that phrase is. It's called To Childhood. I figured like the first book you're going to have to move into childhood. <laughs> childhood. <laughs> Moth eaten faith. Old flame. Old shame. I have sworn you off again to furtively return. Bourbon I stashed in the basement mattress where my uncle whoops it up with country whores. You are no good to me if I continue to abuse you. Why can't I let you die? You've done your chores. Your fish bowl full of formaldehyde. Your toy box rupturing with foreign wars. No one believes you, childhood, let alone my poems. But at night, the lost limb itches. I follow you down my Florida of the mind for Ponce de Leon after his beloved syphilitic guide. Going back to the, the book of first poems was illuminated. I've not been writing poems for about two and a half years now. I've just been writing songs. And uh, but I was surprised by this one. It's called In Those Days, but it felt a lot in some ways like these days. It was written under um, another presidency. Um, it has an epigraph that I will not read because it, too, is better than the poem. <laughs> but I was surprised to find there's a word in here that's a little out of the way. Um, glassine. And glassine is a type of paper that um, is, is thin and translucent. It's made from thoroughly beaten pulp. And I felt that was kind of a quality of being alive. 
in those days. Light reared its glassine house, and onion skin of hours we looked through <coughs> as through a soap filmed pane on frost encrusted fields. So we inhabited ourselves as strangers, eyes trained to a lighted screen in Plato's cave, days images flickering on our brows and chins, lust and conquest, a single severed breast floating by like the face of Orpheus, his lips a nipple pursed on the remembered consequence of song. Was this the day that our desire had made? Was this its end? Those evenings we burned down with oil and camphor, leaving not an ash. What matter? Dawn would raise them up again in tall, translucent panels, as though they had been peeled from our own skin. Well, I'm going to follow in the line of the animal poem. <laughs> this one has an animal in it. I used to own a black lab. I wanted to say that because I didn't want you to get confused with the chocolate lab, but Kelly, the, Kelly does not appear in this poem. <laughs> but Elizabeth Bishop appears in this poem. That's just as good. <laughs> Everything must go. I wanted to read it because it's a spring poem. Everything must go. Early spring, <clears throat> the junk lady hunkers on the stoop of her junked out porch, hawking her ephemera. Sidewalk hordes of plastic Santas, snow globes, yoga videos, porcelain bunnies, <laughs> an army half the size of Mother China. It would weary even Balzac or Elizabeth Bishop to recite. <laughs> Everything must go, she mutters, cries to passers-by, her sagging lower lip balancing the unlit cigarette she's had hanging there since fall. <laughs> she squats, hag, Buddha, as the morning traffic whizzes and the bicyclists looking mildly ridiculous in fluorescent colored tights confetti by into testicular dreams of Tours de France, Lance, Armstrong, Louis, Louis, and you. With the black lab punching itself into a tailed question mark, looking also mildly ridiculous, as the shit sun strains through the anus of itself, <laughs> delivers up another day, thinking, yes, Elizabeth Bishop, surely some dumb bunny loves us all. <laughs> and I conclude with one uh, so, apparently there's a tribe in the American Southwest that uh, before they go on the little peyote hunt, uh, they speak for a couple of weeks, maybe? It's been a long time since I've read this. Um, but for a considerable time, they speak only in negative statements in order to prepare the mind for the vision quest. And I really liked that, and I thought, well, there's an idea for a poem. How about a poem in only negative statements. This is called Longing Song. And it's the last poem I'll read. And thank you again for being here. Let's take a break, shake hands, give hugs, and refresh ourselves, and then we'll be back for more after this. Longing Song. That enchanted door between us, I'll never open it. You will never step inside. We won't live for a thousand years like the Arabians, knowing everything the garden of sensual grat gratification can supply. You won't rise in the morning when the crocus comes and leave me for the sun. There will be no more suns. There will be no earth, no myths, no stories. We will never be greater strangers to one another. 
happiness, contentment, those illusory, lasting treasures, these will not touch us. Loss will not live as it did for us in our time. We had no time. We'll never die. The locket I gave you, the ring of fire, the silver cord, all the photographs destined for our children never pass into being, nor do our children. None of this will have happened. We will never forget each other. <laughs> LGBTQIA plus advocate at Seacoast Outright and does not teach at Phillips Exeter. <laughs> <laughs> but is the distinguished daughter in law of a longtime DEA teacher, John Kane. Goes to my heart. She is also on the board of the Poetry Society of New Hampshire, Leanne Dalton. I have some PA. Um, the first poem I'm going to read uh, is inspired by an essay by Alexander Chi called 1989. And when I read it, it got me, it's about uh, being at an AIDS protest or well, at a protest uh, in San Francisco at a time mm -hmm. when the government was really not excited about knowing that AIDS even existed. Mm -hmm. And it brought me back to a time where I, at age 15, had an AIDS test for the first time. 1985. We got numbers to identify us. We couldn't use our names where the blood was drawn, and we couldn't use them to call for the results. They wouldn't be calling us. We had to wait eight weeks and dial a secret number we couldn't share with anyone to give them our anonymous blood draw number so they could tell us what our new anonymous number was and where to go to get the results. Sometimes the place where they sent us was hundreds of miles away from the place where we had our blood drawn. And once we found the place we had to go, a place that would take us hours to find, we would walk up a slanted flight of stairs to give them the slip of paper that had our new number on. They would match it with the number they had on their list, the number they would also have on the envelope with our results inside. We arrived alone. Only then were we allowed to enter a back room in a building no one knew had back rooms, through a door no one knew that was there except us and the people who answered the anonymous results line, and the person who would sit with us behind a door masked by a black curtain on two metal chairs in an otherwise empty room upstairs from a theater where we had seen some of our idols perform, a theater we could never set foot in again without breaking into a sweat. We handed in our number, were left to sit down on a solitary folding chair in a small waiting room with walls made from black curtains. We waited alone. We waited until we were told to open the door behind one of the curtains and go inside to sit down on one of the two folding chairs in the room. The counselor came into the room through another door and sat down next to us on the second folding chair, holding our envelope with the number on it, never once exchanging names, asking us, if the results are positive, what are you going to do? The unspoken question being, are you going to end your life now or let the disease do it for you? Knowing as they did that we arrived alone 
we would be leaving the room alone, we would exit the building at least as alone as we were when we came. And only if we answered in such a way that the counselor thought we would be stable enough to know our result would the counselor then open the envelope and read to us the result before showing us the result, pointing to it on the paper to see but not to keep. A result we might have wanted to burn, but were not allowed to do so. A result they would immediately destroy, so no one would know we were there. No one would know that we were the kind of people who could possibly have a disease that required two anonymous numbers and no names and a secret room, and someone else to destroy the evidence, just to keep us from being kicked out of our lives. Because if anyone found out we were those people, they would never employ us or minister to us, would never take care of us or touch us or speak to us ever again unless they too walked out of that room into a world they no longer recognized as their own. A world they no longer knew how to live in or die in because die they would and so would we in body or in spirit. Our mutual shame reduced to ashes in a stranger's hands. really was like that. And I couldn't believe that, thinking about it now, there's no <coughs> disease like that, where you have to do all of that just to find out if you're going to that. And as, as if it wasn't fun enough to do that, um, in 2006, I had, I had an aneurysm discovered in my brain, and I had a craniotomy, and I don't recommend that any of you try that. <coughs> that <time. laughs> aneurysm. Sometimes the body wants a denouement of sorts, an unveiling. Here is where the surgeon felt inclined to be kind enough to let you have your hair. And here is where he cut the muscle to your jaw, said later, my friend, if you cannot feel the arc of your own voice in six months' time, you never will. Recovery is a myth you hope contains a single grain of truth, the rest a distortion the shifting dune on which you begin to rebuild the Rivera's house. Its timbers slip and crack with every passing tide. A barrel of laughs, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it got better. <laughs> Waterline. He knows. <laughs> the waves we made are far bigger than I thought I could be. Your name, the beacon his mouth twists into a blowtorch. It flames my face, shakes the remnants holding me down to this wreckage, turns beams to cracked coal, singes the skeletal remains of a life I thought I could live, gone slack. He spurts out the vitriol of insult, injury of no way back, strikes a match to me, insists you're no true friend, surge of a passing storm. My body shelters in place sits down, straddles the rope. The way forward is a feat no sane human would attempt. The way back, a shame not worth the absence of you. Silence of a story no arsonist could ever destroy. I can't unknow you are alive, understand anything else, now that I know you still speak with your hands. How you taste when you kiss, how the salt in my mouth reminds me how easy it is to fall allow the current to pull us down to the waterline, wet sand rising soft, yet solid, under our feet. That's dedicated to my darling husband who can't be here tonight. And, uh, he's my elementary school sweetheart. <laughs> and, uh, and a great guy. <laughs> Right side, wrong side. Everyone asks why I didn't leave, knowing what I knew. His unspoken threats beginning with tago, which it turns out doesn't mean your throat, but the way a person says when they hate you, shut the fuck up, along with a look counting the ways I'd have to fold myself into myself to end the day alive. His chin in the air, sideways scythe of a smile, and there's his throat laid bare, but I can't do it. Twist my hands around my own wrists instead. Refrain of Nwap Desir in my head, a song I still don't completely understand. 
each mouthful of French a little bit gone. Enough that I can't tell you why the singer says, I have to get used to spring without swallows, but I know each time the song comes on in an American cafe, supposedly far away enough from him to be safe, I look at my hands, I wring my hands. I think I hear the singer say the prince gaslights everything so Sleeping Beauty can't negotiate. Dreams of leaving, her eyelids frozen shut. Forget she ever said anything, okay? Because the dove's wings are full of lead, he sings. And we're all going to drown in a puddle. You can drown in so little. But we won't understand what we've done until our throats explode. Or does the singer mean your mouth, your face, shut up? But this next part I know by heart. It isn't turn yourself upside down just to say the right thing, no. It means you will never know. Was I on the right side, wrong side? The refrain he's singing now over my head in the safe cafe. A l'envers, a l'endroit. A l'envers, a l'endroit. Since my husband is here, I get to read this one because it's about him. He <laughs> <laughs> might not be here. He might not listen to it. You can learn a lot just by living if you don't die first. <laughs> <laughs> I have no license to take this ride, to lay my head in your lap, let you fill me in, are almost ex-partners nowhere to be seen. I close my eyes, envision you, barreling down the turnpike halfway to Florida, navigating between Jersey barriers for miles on end. A solid grip of I am so going to die on the wheel. Tom Waits growling windshield diamonds as you scream the scream of a man who waited far too long to learn how to drive. Self-taught. Your <laughs> tail takes a hard right through the Bible Belt, where by this time you suspect you may find out there's a next life, or at the very least, total the already suffering Civic with the hole in the floor so big you can see the road fly by if you're a passenger in the back. But I wasn't. Your life story careens through each passing decade, bouncing off barrier after barrier, jumping from almost caught, but the judge was quite kind, <laughs> to lightning struck you twice, to you don't even know how you got to Alaska, but it wasn't all that bad if you don't count the years it took to leave old habits behind. No pain, no gain. I remember that part. You made a chart, the pros and cons of all your unintentional destinations, where you'd hang your hat you hadn't already given it away, but the place you always wanted to find turns out to be the place you left in the first place without me all those years. And now here you are, screeching to a halt to sit on the riverbank and take your chances, with my head in your lap, me saying okay to all of it, everything, whatever you have done. <laughs> Introducing my good friend Mercy Carbonell. As a member of the English faculty at Phillips Exeter from 1993 to 1996 and 2000 to present, Mercy Carbonell has taught advanced senior creative writing workshops and seminars on the craft of fiction, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, and love. She has developed writing workshops for student speakers, parents, alumni, and the annual MLK Junior Day, co authored the 25th anniversary of Title IX Assembly submitted visual literary art in the gallery, and delivered six meditations to the academy community in Phillips Church. She serves as co-chair of the MLK Day Committee, advisor for Arts and Activism Club, coach for various sports, summer school faculty, Harkness coordinator, and co-director of the Writers' Workshop Summer Institute. And apparently, she doesn't sleep. <laughs> in 2016, Mercy was on sabbatical in France and San Francisco doing research on students in social justice activism, writing and volunteer teaching and tutoring at 826 Valencia Writing Spaces. She lives in Exeter with her partner Lisa and her retriever Scout. Please welcome Mercy.
thank you all for being here, and thank you to Sarah and Ben, of course, and to the whole weekend. Um, I second what Todd said, that we're lucky that this is happening now, and um, I look forward to it continuing. Um, I, one of the down, like I noticed when people were uh, sort of sifting through all their papers that everybody has single page documents, like look at this. Mm -hmm. It's on the back, <laughs> it's a problem. Um, <laughs> so if I suddenly am reading and then it scoops into another piece, don't be surprised. Um, so I'm going to read a piece that is I originally wrote for uh, a program that students designed called We All Bleed Red. And it is, um, I would say, like sort of a long, a long piece. Um, yesterday was the anniversary of the siege of Sarajevo. And I spent time in Sarajevo, um, in Garajda, and in Sarajevo after the war teaching. Um, so it has been much on my mind. I am thinking of blood. I am thinking of blood, of bleeding, of what it feels like to give and to lose blood. Of those I know who have had their blood stolen from them too violently. Of those I know whose blood is not their own. And I am thinking of what it means to serve. Rob Stevenson, a former student I taught when he was in the 12th grade, how he turned 18 on September 11th, the first day of English class. How he had always wanted to go into the military. It was in his family. And then on that golden, terrible day, he had a reason to go. And yet he lived with a blood disorder. Each morning, he would go to the health center to get blood taken. Often, he received transfusions. And he was told initially he could not serve. Years later, I learned he went to bleed for a country he believed in and a war many of us questioned as just. As children, we pricked our fingers and held the tips together, blood sisters, blood brothers, blood he and she and they and ours. We exchanged the language of love. We exchanged vows of loyalty. I will serve you in friendship. I will, we said. What were we willing to sacrifice? We did not ask, but that question was there, and years later, when we would face harder truths, we might begin to question our allegiances. And we knew we had to ask ourselves, what am I willing to sacrifice to stand in solidarity with you? And I think, too, of a close friend who wondered much of his life, of the mother who gave birth to him, the father who was his seed, the siblings he may or may not have had. When you do not know where your own blood comes from, Whose blood did my friend bleed when he fell from a bike and scraped his knee at seven? Whose blood did he bleed when he came up out of the ocean on a rock of barnacles at 55, his hands watercolor painting red? I am thinking of the blood of my mother's best friend spread across her bedroom wall after she had been raped and stabbed to death. I am thinking of how memory is an artery. I am remembering deep purple, red, knees, the shade of Sarajevo roses and I am wishing for a radical healing. In Sarajevo, there is a bridge where it is said two teenage lovers met. He was a Serb, she was a Bosnian, and in the midst of the war, they made a pact to escape. They met one night on the bridge, and when the snipers rang out from the roof of the Holiday Inn, they fell to the ground and then crawled toward each other. They were found in the morning in an embrace. Their blood spilled ink-deep fuchsia where they lay. When I was living in Sarajevo after the war in the 90s, I often walked across this bridge when Adnan needed milk, or Aida wanted to meet for coffee, or I wanted to buy fresh tomatoes and melon at the market that had been bombed three years earlier. In the hills leading up out of the town, there are old playing fields from the 1984 Olympics, fields that are now cemeteries, cemeteries separated by religion and nationality. There were, in those years, landmines everywhere. For so long, I imagined the lovers' ghosts seeking one another beneath the soil where they were buried. And in that dream story, they discover each other, and then it blurs. Because how does a ghost bleed? Maybe you need to write about grace. I can hear the poet Robert Haas saying. Last year in Exeter, I saw a sticker on the window of a truck. It was in the shape of the United States, and to create that shape where the words, fuck off, were full. This in the town where I have lived for so long, for most of my adult life. Did I not notice the signifiers of such hate before? Did I used to walk past a truck like this with a sticker like this and see it and shrug and say, that figures? I waited by this truck, kind of wishing the owner to come out of the first savings bank or walk up from the farmer's market, or maybe he, she, they was just getting a haircut at the barber and I was almost late for class. <coughs> 
I wanted to look the owner in the eye, offer a hand, and then I was torn. What I wanted to say would not have ended well. And I could not muster the strength and the courage to ask what Paul D. asks in Toni Morrison's Beloved, why, 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 why? So I took a photograph and I walked to class to discuss with students Martin Sherman's play Bent about two gay men in the Holocaust trying for the dignity of being stripped of them, finding love in a concentration camp. And where is the love? Seeing that sticker in this town, thinking of the black and brown students harassed walking to Walgreens, and those I know who are undocumented, I feel the bruising of all I do not know where to place, the red hot pain of all I fear, the blood's desire to retreat into a space and a place in which I know whose loyalties are whom, who is friends with whom, who voted for whom. The poet Meg Day speaks of the process of disidentification, how in the pursuit to find out who we are, there is always a casting off and always a discovering. What I have been asking myself might I cast off, and in that casting off, whom might I discover? What am I willing to sacrifice? At the blood mobile in the parking lot of the Stratum Veterinary Clinic, a volunteer nurse with a tattoo that shows he has fought in recent wars, comes over to me to begin the process of drawing my blood into a bag to give to someone who may need it to live. He smiles down at me and asks me about the tattoo on my wrist. It is a symbol of the idea of the present tense, I tell him, and he smiles and inserts the needle, and I have to look out the window so I won't faint, and he knows I'm struggling and he doesn't say a word. He touches me gently on the arm and allows me to continue looking out the window at the leaves falling in the church old. You are giving blood, you are serving, he tells me with that touch. You will never know where your blood will travel. So we bleed on as this nation where some of us were born is witnessing the destruction of democracy. So we bleed on, we fall in love, we fight, we falter, we forgive. How can we honor the strangers in ourselves? How can we cast off with compassion parts of who we are in order to discover and serve with love those strangers whose blood is not our own? When a landmine explodes, the shrapnel tears flesh faster than the speed of sound. In that silhouette of blood blazing across the body of a child, I try to ask. And you thought yours were sad. <laughs> 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 I usually like to write a funny happy poem. Okay. Um, so this next one is uh, a little bit of backstory. My father was diagnosed a while ago with a disease called Huntington's chorea, um, which affects in your uh, in the, it, it manifests itself in your physical movement, much like Parkinson's, and it is um, but twenty possibly 20 to 25 years before that, it manifests itself in your emotional and cognitive degeneration. And my father was an architect. Um, he is an architect, I should say. He is still there. This is called Camera Obscura. Most nights when a small child wakes in the middle of an hour and follows the dim light into her parents' bedroom, there is her father, in his late 20s, thin brown hair, long limbs, leaning over the creation of a model for a courthouse, or a library, or a theater. A 1968 black metal lamp perched like a mechanical egret over his work, the rest of the room in muted gray darkness. Sometimes he does not notice her. She watches his hands, steady. He cuts a thick piece of cardboard with a mat knife, or the way he tinkers with various pieces of the design so they stand up. A staircase, a balcony, a row of shelves, seats, books one day. Once the model is conceived, she watches him glue the tiny trees and tiny people to show the space and future motion. Once the model is finished, she peers in, as if living in a miniature world, often, often wishing she could be that small to wander through new buildings without windows yet, without electricity. In those models, it is always daylight. In those models, a design world is both frozen and dynamic at once. In those models, her father's mind is still very much present. This March, she walks into his study to ask him if she can help him pack his books and maps and blueprints into boxes before the movers come. He does not hear her enter. He is studying a photograph, his long, thin fingers shaking to keep the sepia square steady. She takes in the room, once her parents' bedroom, 
30 years later, a long door as a desk, the dust of lamps unplugged, bookshelves stacked far too full, piles of bank statements, student loans, John Deere manuals, architectural digests dating back to 1964, business cards bound in rubber bands, cameras no longer operable, lined up along one shelf, pens gathered in bouquets of red, blue, black. In this photograph, she is a baby, leaning over the edge of a carrying crib. And then she remembers his makeshift dark room in the basement, the smell of the developer, the terms he taught her, recording light, durable images. How he, she used to sneak down and watch from behind the wooden stairs what she called her aperture of yellow. How he would lift an image with tongs from the stop bath and then the fixer. How he would hang it along a twine strung. How her father would wait, leaning against the sink, a pause of rememory. A father fades, his chromosome four mutating. A daughter is returned to infancy in a stilled frame across time. What comes into focus is often not what we imagine. Um, and then I think one more. Um, some of you know that uh, my former partner, Christine Robinson, um, was a teacher at Phillips Exeter for many, many years. And in Phillips Church, there is a weekly service of meditations. Um, she was most prolific in that space and we held her uh, service there. Um, I also tend to give a writing prompt where you take a line from a piece and the graph, and then you just run with it. Um, so this, this line is from um, David Wang's M. Butterfly, I hear your voice everywhere now. 20 years from now, I may remember why I saved that Joan Armitrading ticket stub for September 24th, 2015 at the Music Hall in Portsmouth. I may remember the phone call from my father that night telling me that my mother had been taken to the hospital in Cambridge en route to New Hampshire, that she might not make it to your service, that she had taken a nasty fall on the way to dinner, a very deep bruising, the nurse had told him. I may remember that bruise, her stained flesh that ran up and over her thigh, along her psoas, and that skirt she wore to your memorial in Phillips Church. She told the doctor she simply had to go, and she left. I may remember that black thin silk. And after Russell opens the service and Jules reads an Adrian Rich poem, after Wailing offers a reflection of having you as a teacher, after Lissa and Chaz speak of your activism, and John Kane tells us stories of you as a daring teenager and cannot finish his sentences through his sorrow, after David stands shaking in his brother love so long unexpressed, after I conjure Boaz and Israel and the years of letters between you and your passion for ink and paper and envelopes and candlelight writing, after Jamie closes the service, I feel myself waiting for your voice in the space of Philip's church, the space where you have given so many meditations in your years. And I know my mother has arrived, for I have caught her eye when I'm speaking. And so when the music ends, I stand to find the woman who held me as a young child, and I let her hold me again, her embrace all I need in this moment. I wish I could have taken a photograph of the look in her eyes, salt wet and weeping, and I wish I could send it to you, wherever you are now, and I wish I could tell you how much she came to love you too, despite the early years, the initial rejection, the odd shuffling around the fact that she was simply not ready, not ready to have a daughter in love with a woman. Later that evening, after wine and soup and stories, my mother lifts her skirt to show us all her bruise, the tea lights across my yard illuminating a scar where she was once grafted in an exchange for skin. That night, I imagine you teasing her for being so bold and beautiful in that moment. Oh, Lynn, you might chuckle. At 75, you still have it, you might say. And there she is, laughing. That night, Matthew lights a campfire the smoke in our clothes for days, and we all gather around it to remember you. John Forte shows up with his guitar and asks if we want to hear a song he is writing for you. He is with the woman he will soon marry. He is in love. When he sings, no one, no one says it out loud, but we all feel you listening. I may remember my mother's scars, the appendix mark I loved to run my fingers across, the way it marbled under my thumb as a child, how years later I lay in the sun on the beach beside her to compare those scars, mine in the winter of sixth grade, hers in college, five years before I was born. Sometimes I worry I will be the one who must identify her, if that is the story I will become, the uncertain moment the future may bring. Sometimes I wonder within an understanding of intimacy only formed later in our lives, 
If my father remembers her when she was young, 23 years, both of them still on the edge of creating a long life together. Often, I wish I could talk with you about their aging, about how they too may soon die. This, I know now, is work I never imagined. When your mother died, your mind was already lost in the fragmented spiral of your early dementia. You never saw her to say even a stuttered goodbye. The June you gave your last breath, David and I tossed your ashes into the Atlantic so you could float with your mother's dust bones. Some days, I catch the way you pronounce barn in your New Hampshire accent. I still remember you saying something to my mother to hear her laugh, her beautiful laugh. And when I enter that church, I think I can hear you reading out loud the eulogy you never had the chance to live through. Thank you. Um, it is my honor to introduce Maggie Dietz, the author of That Kind of Happy and Perennial Fall, which won a Jane Kennedy Award and a Wisconsin Library Association Literary Award. She previously taught creative writing at Boston University and served as assistant poetry editor for Slate from 2004 to 2012. She also served as director of the Favorite Poem Project, founded by Robert Pinsky during his terms as United States Poet Laureate. With Pinsky, she co-edited the anthologies, the anthologies Americans' Favorite Poems, Poems to Read, and An Invitation to Poetry. Dietz is the recipient of a Grolier Poetry Prize, a George Bennett Fellowship at Phillips Exeter Academy, and fellowships from the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts and the Fine Arts Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts. She is Associate Professor in the Creative Writing Concentration at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and she is a good friend. Welcome. I'm aware of the time, so I will read briefly. Um, but I do want to thank Sarah and Ben and um, and the the committee for this um, wonderful weekend. Um, so um, the, my it's not going to be funny or light things up too much, but um, <laughs> I can try. I change. I change it. Um, but I will say that uh, I'll, I'll say a funny thing. So, so I'm, just, I'm married to that guy that uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is a laughable situation. But um, and our daughter, uh, one day uh, you were out, and Ralph, you were out with Kempy, and uh, Ralph rolls down the window. No, no, no and we yells, were in the car, and, and I rolled down the window and yelled. Country boards to rob on the I'm table. telling the story. <laughs> the story. Ralph yells, Country whores at Todd. And Kenny says, Why does that guy always say country horse every time he says that? Okay, so I'll just read, I'll read like maybe three poems. And um, I decided to, I read here not long ago, and um, um, I decided that I would read some just Exeter, uh, specifically Exeter poems tonight. Um, so this one um, is takes place on the, the fields at, at Phillips Exeter, um, where I do not teach. But for <laughs> uh, uh, so um, I I know a lot of birders since moving to New Hampshire, and I am not one, but this bird in particular interested me, and it's, a, it's in keeping with the animal poem theme. <laughs> Killdeer. The bird limped through my dreams, my days. I'd seen it for two weeks, stipping, stitching steps across the ball field, swift as a jacket zipper. It'd see me coming and rake one wing across the grass, hitch in its giddy-up, Coarse notes pitched from its throat, a trick to draw me away from the naked nest, nothing but a couple of pebbles, a few strands of dry grass tufting three ink-stippled ivory eggs, smooth as Dalmatian jasper. How brutally stupid it must have looked, the morning the room-sized rotary mower cleared the field, the bird's gimp instinct, rising cries, unnoticed by the driver, and nothing to the blade. Um, and this is uh, a 
I thought I'd read this poem, April Incantation, um, which I started notes on years and years ago um, and finished more recently. Um, it's in my most recent book. Um, after there was this huge flood, and Todd's uh, the classroom was actually in the basement at the time, and he lost all his books and his Harkness table, these big giant tables they sit around at PEA, was, was floating on the water. And the stuff on top of the table was saved, but everything else was lost. Um, uh, so I, I took notes um, during that time and then came, came back to this later um, when I was enraged about something. <laughs> Not having to do with Todd. <laughs> Just rare. No, I'm just uh, April incantation. Oh, wrathful rain, roll down and down. Outwit the drains, unground us. Wind and thunder, steer the torrent's train and throw us under. Upriver, water, rage and rack the dam to shatter. Blast the happy poppies. Let petal blood trouble the flooded field. Crack new borns and boundaries into parceled plots. Wreck even the season that reared you. Lick the lilacs into sobbing heaps. Flounce the furrows and swallow the seeds. Gut the leaf rucked gutters. Wrestle reed beds into rags. Wrench up headstones. Grub the graves and spit the picked bones in the ocean. Show us nothing sacred, nothing safe. Fair enough. I fed this flood. I'll take my place among the fallen sodden. And I'll end with this poem, which um, started <laughs> um, at a dinner party. Oh, the only writers slower than me are dead. And <laughs> so, like, this I started notes on, um, you know, when we moved here 16 years ago or something, and I, I just finished the poem. So I read, um, when I read here um, last, I, I read a version of this poem, and um, it, was, it was fresh then, and now I think it might actually be finished. And this is the last um, poem I, I'll read, and then I'll introduce our last reader, Erica. Um, uh, so this was uh, a dinner party. This is the kind of dinner party that happens in Exeter, New Hampshire. <laughs> the title is Mummy. <laughs> Over plates of quinoa salad and mango chicken, it appeared out of closet, resurrected from a dusty hat box and passed around like a sleeping infant, a 3,000-year-old, 16-year-old girl, or parts of a girl, the forearms and head. The body may be taken for its rags to make brown butcher paper. The hat box had bloomed from a larger box labeled by a child's hand with black magic marker, Greek artifacts, brimming with other broken ancient things, cracked kylix, one-horned terracotta bowl, and stowed next to a box coughing tinsel marked Xmas and another marked wedding gifts, evidently lugged unopened house to house since the long ago wedding of our just divorced host. Inherited Victorian plunder, curiosities bought up by one of George Washington's descendants, whose legal woes our friend's grandfather fixed, he said, pouring more Pinot. Football season, and one guest yelled, go long, faked lobbing the head across the room. Another <laughs> pretended to use an arm as a back scratcher. Everybody laughed. I laughed. Took the head in my hands. Just above the temple, a hole so you could see the yellow skull. The wrapping parted like hair. I passed the head and took an arm. Where the wrap had frayed at the tips of the fingers were brown fingernails. The wrists slashed where leaders had snagged a bracelet, a hole below the knuckle of one finger. Mm. Then from the same box, our friend produced a broken falcon, walnut head, the severed body narrowing like a bottle stopper, the wings dried tobacco leaves closing over its breast. Chorus. Son of Isis, sun god, sky god, god of protection. Had they killed the bird to bury her with it? Somebody's beloved child, long dead daughter of the long dead. 
days were when she watched the bird circle and dive and later pinched mites from its feathers with her fingernails, her rings catching sun, scattering seeds of light. Late afternoons, she'd laugh and hitch up her gold and pomegranate robes to run, teasing the boy who'd given her the bracelet, carnelian and feldspar, until he caught her small, bright body in his arms. She kissed him. His breath warmed her neck. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Erica. Um, Erica Plazur's flash fiction collection, Heard Around Town, won the 2014 Arcadia Fiction Chapbook Prize. Another fiction chapbook, Dry Dock, was published by Redbird Press in spring 2015. Her fiction has appeared in McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, The Greensboro Review, Meridian, American Short Fiction, Fiction Southeast, Flash, The International Short Story, Short Short Story Magazine, and elsewhere. She lives and teaches in Exeter, New Hampshire, guess where? <laughs> and can be found online at ericaplouflazur.com. Um, thank you all for sticking around, uh, and thank you so much to Sarah and then to the, everyone who helped to organize the, the Lit Fest. Um, I hope this is the first of many to come. Uh, and, and thank you all to my, my colleagues and everybody who, who read this evening. It was really beautiful to get these little glimpses into everyone's life and creative work. Um, my, my two pieces tonight are keeping in theme with the the water, um, the river, and the stories the waters can offer us, and um, as well as animals. So um, <laughs> this one's a little closer to home than the last one. Be. Lost and found. If my walk on the river this afternoon is reflective of the state of things, then there are too many lost gloves in the world. <laughs> too many lost gloves on benches or knit hats, stuffed bunnies, scribbled on coloring books bloated and distorted from the overnight dew. Under the benches, children have placed colored rocks with funny messages, a geocache hunt for the preschool set. Other children find the rocks, get their mommies to post photos to the hashtag site, and the world in this moment feels just a bit closer, a bit more connected. Usually, the Salt River holds its share of mallards and herons, an occasional beaver, but today, a seal far too upriver for its own good, searches for fish in the murky depths below. His slick brown head peeks out onto the horizon, incurious, then wrestles with an eel, or is it a lamprey? And then he is gone. Once, someone left an L.L. Bean windbreaker and a pack of unopened cigarettes on a bench, the dingy red Sox ball cap that no fan would ever want to touch. Everyone from the morning solitary joggers to the tri-clusters of hardy walkers let it be for about a week, wondering after its owner. Someone eventually folded the coat, placed the cigarettes in the cap, as if to convey to passers-by that the items were accounted for and awaiting pickup of the owner, so please do not touch. <laughs> Last spring, when a kid from town went missing, a high schooler out on a run, the entire town searched for him. They combed the reedy borders of the river, finding empty discarded ice cream cups and plastic spoons, a nest of turtle eggs, a magazine blown under a fence. They waded the trail along the parkway in tall galoshes, peering up into the trees, following the path of the river through businesses and backyards toward the forest as the helicopter circled overhead, looking for a body in the water, a lone figure wandering a blonde-haired boy in running clothes. In every building they looked, at home, in school, finding surprised teenagers hiding their sweethearts in closets and <laughs> under beds. But none of those was the kid who went missing, the one whose name and photo was on every TV and Facebook feed. And as the story of him spread, everyone felt connected, a bit closer to each other, pitching in to find the kid as though he were our own. In the end, they found him not along the river, or in the park, or at school, but in the stacks of the town library, asleep, red-faced, ashamed by the attention. And everyone relieved, returned to their lives, 
return to littering plastic spoons, forgetting their mittens on benches and hats and crosswalks, and as they searched, as sorry, in crosswalks, as they searched for painted stones and signs of life, wildlife along the river. <coughs> and the last one I will read is called Last Day. And um, those, those of you who know me will know I will never um, miss an opportunity to talk about my fascination with snorkeling and exploring what happens under the sea. And um, there's so much out there. So this is a little glimpse into that. It's called Last Day. Last day, we say. Our hair rips and ribbons as the last cast of sun spans our faces, descending into the ocean, into the approaching night. We'd spent the week underwater, armed with fins and goggles, imprinting into our brains as we swam, patterns of elk horn and sea fan, tiny fluorescent polyps and docile technicolor fish. At night, we returned to blue, dreaming from inside oceans, one morning, we catch sight of a spotted skate, an eagle ray, we insist, and in the afternoon, a sea turtle. We get lost in walls of shimmering fish, thousands of them, like tiny blue lights hovering in and around us. We avoid the black spiked urchins resembling cartoon landmines and scour reef and rock alike in search of sly octopus. They have no bones, we say, in an attempt to explain their absence. We just have to know how to look. And today, tonight, is our last day, night. And so we stand on the shoreline and hold hands and ask the day to stay, to last, so we can search for the octopus, the seahorse, the undiscovered fish, another turtle, keeping at bay the thrilling terror of shark. We want to keep our minds forever imprinted with the patterns of this liquid underworld, to experience the miracle of silence and presence, of quest and discovery, one deep breath at a time. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the readers, and um, thank you all for being here. Um, before you drive home, please grab some cookies and check out what's on the table on the porch. And thank you to Renee, and the entire uh, Lit Fest committee, because it's been an honor to be part of this. Um, and I hope to see you all again.